Well, hello, 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 hello. It's Wednesday night. It is the 4th of September. I am Dave Dawn, and in the big monitor tonight, we have the effervescent loveliness, the bubblicious babe that is the one and only Sav. In a big monitor tonight, how are you? Um, all right, I'm, I'm alive. This is good. <laughs> you, you have survived the trip to Brussels. I have, just but Just not necessarily the trip back no 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 it's just wrong on so many levels isn't it yes on so many levels yes. um welcome back everybody uh, it's lovely to be with you again after having some time off but i see things have been festering and uh, gurgling during the period while i've been away um and i want to say a big thank you uh, to everybody that's been standing in on these team talks. I've managed to catch two or three of them and I've got to say I'm massively impressed. I really, really enjoyed that. What the ones I watched it was great. It's good stuff. Well done. It was very fun to do and the team really pulled together well. It was brilliant. I, I'm, I'm so proud to be part of this team because they've done an absolutely corking job. It's been yeah. lovely. Um, and you know it's kind of no need to worry and stuff like that which which is is really really good uh, however we've got an awful lot to get through tonight um if you're watching this on video on demand you'll know how long it's going to run we don't at the minute but you will because it's at the right hand side of the, the screen um make sure your glasses are full make sure that your atomizers and tanks and everything else are also full and that you've got spare juice to hand we've got a lot to get through on this episode of vt talk Yes, indeed. It's uh, VT Talk as ever was, and I nearly forgot to mute my output here. There, it's been so long since I've used the gear. Um, since I saw you last, things have moved on a pace, have they not, Sav? Oh, they certainly have. Um, very, it, very quickly. It's been very, very busy. And when I got back into uh, the UK uh, early on last week, um, I got asked, would I go to Brussels on Monday gone, second of September? Um, in order to chair a press conference on the 3rd and speak to some MEPs. And Sav and I went, um, and I've got to say, I'm gonna say a huge big thank you to you, Sav, because uh, I could not have done what I was doing without you there. Um, no problem. She, she's my memory. She remembers the things that I forget, because I'm getting old and forget lots. And she runs brilliant interference, and she keeps people in order, and I like that. It's kind of, well, she had a good teacher, let's put it that way. You've learned off your mum, haven't you? Oh, I certainly have. My mum taught me everything I know. Yes, and, and, and I'm here to tell you, she knows a lot. Shall we blast on with it all and, and, and kind of run through what we did on the Monday morning? Yeah, the that Monday, sounds like plan. Monday afternoon when we got there. Do you want to take that up? <laughs> oh, well, I'm terrible with names, but I can make a start after the... I mean, the Monday morning was was bad enough. The three thirty start out, <laughs> 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 which was hectic. But by the, when we got there, we had um, meetings lined up with. Now this is where you have to help me out. Our first meeting was with Renata Sommer. Yes, and she is German EPP. She is German EPP. You found a piece of paper, have you? Yes, I've had a piece of paper. <laughs> and first of all, I have to say, what a lovely lady she was. Yes. And we met in the members bar. We did. Which was interesting. And we sat down, first of all, with her assistant, who was very, very informative and very interested in what we had to say. And then the lady herself arrived. And I'll let Dave take over with what, what was said then. Right. Well, Renata Summer is APP. And as, as you'll recall from prior to the break, EPP, um, it's, I think it's European People's Party, is kind of pivotal in all of this. They're centre-right, but they have the biggest grouping um, of all of the groupings, as I understand it. And before the break, they were split more or less down the middle. Um, when we spoke with Renata Sommer, uh, she, 
she was spitting teeth about the speed at which the plenary vote was going to take place. Um, and what, what we should probably say is originally it was scheduled for October. It wasn't scheduled for September, it was scheduled for October. And the rapporteur has brought it forward and there are various different opinions as to why she's done that. The one that sticks in my mind mostly is, as I believe was said on Tuesday, she's running scared. Um, I'm not entirely certain what of, but again, there are various opinions about that as well. So Renata Sommer um, said that she was seeking to have the plenary date put back to where it was in October. She thought it was disgusting and ill-conceived that it was brought forward into September because it would only give uh, members three and a half days to peruse a document that's over 360 pages and come up with any amendments that they might want to table. So we parted on very good terms and she pledged 100% support from her and her team and a lot of her colleagues and she also said that she'd be doing her best to persuade the rest of the EPP to think in exactly the same way as her, which was very good. And thereafter, we went to see uh, Georges Bach, wasn't it, Sav? Yes, it was. And uh, what did you make of him? I thought he was a very, very interesting man and incredibly willing to listen to mm. what we had to say. Yes, he, he asked some very, very pertinent questions um, and didn't know the answers to them and was quite surprised to see the kinds of devices that, that Sav and I had with us, um, as were most of the people that we spoke to i think it's safe to say isn't it yeah oh yes definitely yes uh it was it was very much a case of you know they're seeing stuff like this and uh mvps and and and, and all kinds of stuff and th they just hadn't been exposed to them um so it was it was extremely interesting to talk to them and as we came away from from george back he too said uh that he thought the e-cigs were in the right, that there shouldn't be medicines. It made no sense to him, no sense to Renata Sommer, that there could be any chance of them being less available than tobacco or cigarettes. And this is something I'm, I've, I've been picking up. That's what most people have been saying. Would you agree, Sav? Totally, totally agree. Um, everyone that we spoke to was coming out with that exact thing. I think that's, uh, that's quite probably what's got Ms. McVan, Ma oh, McAvan, so scared um, because as time is going by and as MEPs are becoming more informed, more and more of them are coming to understand that medicines regulation inevitably will mean that electronic cigarettes will be less available than tobacco cigarettes. Now, I need to say that whenever we were talking to any of these people i always made it perfectly clear that as far as i was concerned on a personal level if knowing what the risks were people wanted to smoke i had no problem with that it's entirely up to them it is their choice it is my choice to use e-cigs uh, but i also pointed out that if i couldn't get e-cigs well i was interviewed a few times and we'll, we'll maybe get to that towards the end of the show i don't know um but that kind of took us through Monday. It was quite an interesting day, speaking to aides, speaking to um, MEPs, and getting a feel for it. What What was your feel on the Monday, Sav? Before we went in, I was, quite frankly, I was terrified. I thought we were going to be basically looked down upon and told to go away. They're too busy to talk to us, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And after talking to both people, I walked away feeling hang on, these people actually do want to know what we've got to say and they are interested and they're willing to take on board and they weren't as sort of not uneducated but yeah they didn't necessarily know about the devices that we were using but they knew exactly the importance of these things and that was so refreshing I've walked away from that feeling very very positive. Indeed um, I will say that we, we walked away from a couple of the meetings feeling very very lost mm -hmm. because it's a rabbit warren yes how anybody can find their way around the european parliament i just do not know it, it's a rabbit warren it's huge um and there are rooms everywhere um but that that kind of took care of of monday 
um, and then we get to Tuesday and I think it's probably as easy I think if uh, if we just play the video in yeah just to set the scene um, there was a press conference on Tuesday morning and at the press conference I was joined by a panel that I've got the highest possible regard for I was there to chair it I wasn't there to do anything other than introduce people really um, and be the gob on a stick it's what I am stop laughing <laughs> it's true well yes <laughs> and I'm here to tell you I was as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof but I thought people might be interested to see what happens at a press conference like this because inevitably on the telly all you get is little snippets the, the sound bites and stuff like mm. that so I thought you might like to see the whole thing and I'm, I've got to say thank you to Andy Sutton and the SWAF campaign because I've got the footage that uh, his cameraman shot um, and th there's a couple of little little edits in it but this is pretty much it as it came before the question and answer I'm not going to play the question and answer session in because we'd still be here after midnight and you'll probably understand why is that okay with you Sav? that sounds like a great plan we'll do that and then uh, this is around about 40 minutes um, but it's well worth listening to and you will see why where are you off to today? International Press Centre this morning for a press conference for saveesigs.com where hopefully we're going to go some way towards saving eSigs it's a big job How are you feeling about that? I was ever nervous. Um, this is a presentation to the world's press about why e-cigs ought not to be made medicines in the Tobacco Products Directive and it's important that they get the right message. But there's a really good panel involved. Um, hopefully we'll get the message across. Morning everybody. Are we all fit and well I hope? Here in Brussels, I hope everybody's found their way here up here. Um, before we start, I'd like to say thank you to VapeTrails.tv, Knowledge Action Change and Totally Wicked for sponsoring this event. Without funding from various different sources, there's no way you can get anything done in today's climate. Um, we're here, hopefully, to save e-cigs, and you may be wondering why e-cigs need saving. Um, Smoke Without Fire is a video campaign, I suppose you would call it, that's going to be ending up being a feature length documentary um, and the makers of that documentary have provided us with some footage that might help fill in the gaps for those of you that are unsure why e seeks need to be saved. Richard? Hi, I'm Andy Sutton and I'm director of Smoke Without Fire, the story of the electronic cigarette. I've worked in TV for 15 years and I've also been a vapor for five. When I found out about the EU's plans to regulate electronic cigarettes as medicines, I decided to get interested in the story behind the e-cig. The European Parliament is trying its best to define these things as medicines. This legislation is now being, is now being pushed through at a fast rate and the uh, the rapporteur, the, the team leader for the European Parliament, Linda McCavan, is Taking the, taking, the, taking the lead in pushing it through as fast as she possibly can. And I think this is very, very unfortunate because the potential health benefits of e-cigs are not sufficiently widely appreciated. You, you've heard about uh, levelling the playing field. Yes, but what they mean is levelling the playing field with uh, the nicotine gums and patches. And this is in the advantage of the pharma industry who doesn't want to see a competitor. The right way to um, regulate e-cigarettes is as consumer products. And it's ridiculous to regulate them as medicines. They're not medicines, not in common sense and not in law. They're not used for treatment and the people selling them aren't selling healthcare products. The MHRA, when it enacts it all, would be quite within its rights to say, right, everything that's on the market now that doesn't already have a marketing authorization, within 21 days, it's got to be off the shelves. These would be outlawed. These would become medicines. Effectively, they would be banned. In April 2013, I started a crowdfunding campaign to raise the budget to make a film about people fighting against government control. It's become a community in and of itself. It's become a force to be reckoned with. The film's potential has been likened to Supersize Me, but for smokers. The idea behind it 
is to find out the story of the electronic cigarette and the people who use them. For me, this is a substitute for smoking. So if this is a medicine, then is tobacco considered a medicine? Vaping for me is great because it means that I can continue to to take the nicotine without all the without all the sort of rubbish that comes with that. It's been market driven from from day one. Um, the users have driven the market. The users have discovered for themselves what works and what doesn't, and they've swapped notes. This documentary also looks at what motivates governments to discredit and try and regulate the electronic cigarette. On the 7th of May in Brussels, Mr. Roberto Bertolini made a presentation at the uh, EU workshop that was appalling. Uh, nicotine can be, you can have overdose of nicotine, I mean, which can create major problems. I mean, uh, both to the gastrointestinal, respiratory, cardiovascular, neurological system. His presentation consisted in uh, cherry picking uh, negative studies, studies that show that e-cigarettes are bad. So I confronted him on that and he, he didn't like it. WHO after all is here to protect the health of the public and by taking such an approach they are not doing their job. It's difficult to understand the motivation of, of some of these people. Um, I know that there are some extremely good public health advocates in that field who are very surprised and shocked and very disappointed. A large body of their colleagues is, is prepared to focus on the negatives when there are such potential benefits that could be brought to bear here. I think there's stuff that's coming out of the World Health Organization, both at um, a sort of global level and in Europe, is just frankly appalling. If a student had presented such a work to me, I would have given him a very bad grade. What would motivate a government or health authority to try and remove a product which is scientifically proven to be less harmful than smoking tobacco? Liquids deliver much fewer chemical compounds than, than smoke. In smoke, there are th several thousand chemical compounds that were identified. There are no health concerns associated with the vapor. So to oppose e-cigarettes, it's a perversion of public health. Uh, we've seen these uh, measures cropping up in various parts of the world where they're trying to ban uh, uh, e-cigarettes, or at least e-cigarettes with effective doses of nicotine. Nicotine at the dosage used by vapors and smokers is, is not toxic. Five months into filming, we've already travelled all around Europe, filming interviews with politicians. I knew nothing about e-cigs until I first got a letter, handwritten from someone whose life had been transformed by the use of e-cigs. I wrote a blog um, sort of giving my opinion on how you know electronic cigarettes should be regulated and I received something like 75 comments on there. So I did a bit of consultation through local newspapers and letters poured in from people with similar situations. The government has to take notice that uh, uh, the rights of these people have to be respected. E-cigarettes clearly are not medicines. Medicines cure people or, or treat illnesses. Uh, E-cigarettes are products. They're products that people choose to use instead of smoking tobacco cigarettes. I'll go away uh, and put those concerns into a letter which I'll send to the Health Minister. Since, as far as I know, there is no evidence whatever that this product is going to do harm. Quite the reverse. It's, uh, it's there to do some good. Our cameras have witnessed angry armies of vapours protesting against EU regulation. These balloons represent the lives of smokers that would be saved if the European Parliament and Envy Committee got it right today, these are lives that can be saved by e-cigs because e-cigs save lives! Uh, it's important that MEPs understand that there is a, a huge consumer support for uh, having these things as consumer products, not medicinal products. In the UK, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has already signed up to the idea of medicines regulation and that's supported by the Department of Health in England. Some people say, well, we're leading the way, but I think we're leading the way in the wrong direction. We've met hundreds of vapors and they're all determined to stay away from burning tobacco. And it's cost the government and the taxpayer absolutely nothing. Uh, so my name's George and been vaping these four years. I see myself as a recreational nicotine user. When I realised that I could, in tandem, still enjoy smoking in my way, 
and yet not have to suffer the horrible consequences of that. Everybody I spoke to that smoked had to find out about this. The word nicotine has been associated with the bad health effects of smoking, and unfairly so. I found it to be the answer. Vaping for me was an answer that I will never regret. If their rules were to go ahead tomorrow, everything will get everything that we know will get taken off the shelves and sod the health of their citizens. If you continue to sell cigarettes on open sale, you should continue to sell the alternative, the safer alternative. The losers will be the people using e-cigarettes and those who are smoking and looking to get onto e cigs or hopefully get away from cigarettes at some point. It's quit or die, and it's not about quitting or dying for us. It's about changing to something that is 99% safer than smoking. It's not something that needs to be regulated medicinally because I'm not going to go and see a doctor and say, I want to reduce the harm from drinking full fat Coke. Can I have a prescription for Diet Coke, please? That's what they can't grasp, but they will have to grasp it because we're not going away. We've interviewed the vendors about the proposed restrictions on nicotine strength and flavourings. Our, our vapors, uh, they've written to their MEPs, they've, they've written to, to, to their local MPs as well. Um, they're very vocal um, about the, uh, the fact that they don't want the, the liberty, that they feel that this is their right. It's not like somebody taking your cornflakes away in the morning, you know, let's get some Weetabix. Um, this is something really much more intrinsic to the person. Take away my ability to find my nicotine and I'll find it somewhere else. Take away this, I'm going to go back to where I was before, which is knowingly killing me. People who just go back to smoking. I mean, if I offered you four milligram of juice or a packet of 20 Bevson Edges, what are you going to do? You're going to go straight to the Bevson Edges and you're going to be va smoking again. The vaping community has united, using social media to get their message across to a global audience. I'm seeing tweets to celebrities, to MPs, to MEPs, using the hashtag AUEasig ban. That is giving us a voice. Here in Germany we have oh, about 2 million e-cigarette users. I am appalled that the plan to classify the nicotine I use in my e-cig um, as a medicine. If the EU's plans go ahead, I'll have to go back to smoking cigarettes. What would be available um, actually doesn't work as well as you might think it works. Please don't medicalise vaping. It would mean that I and thousands of others would return to needing to smoke normal cigarettes. Which effectively means this legislation is going to kill me. It's a recreational thing. I, I don't want to quit taking nicotine. My life has improved from one simple little invention. They're not medicines because I'm not sick. I think banning them is ridiculous. My message to all you MEPs is please don't take this away because the truth is I'll probably go back to cigarettes and I'll probably die as will many of the other vapors here. For a public health issue, so important and for people not to have their view or their right to vote, it's, it's a disgrace in my eyes. When the ban comes in, um, I won't be able to get it. If this goes through in 2016 and we can't have them, then it's going to put so many people smoking again, it's unbelievable. Vaping has completely changed my life in more ways than just not smoking anymore. Help families live longer. Help children have the parents. That's the reason why I did it. And while my family are happy that I now vape and no longer smoke. Europe, no. Leave our e-cigarettes alone. Don't ban e-cigs. Please do not take e-cigarettes away from us. You will kill people, simple as that. Vapors are getting face to face and challenging their elected representatives. Linda McAvan, Labour MEP for Yorkshire and the Humber, is leading the EU's challenge on e-cigs and recently was interviewed on camera by one of her own constituents. Can I just show you this that is from The Lancet? I was asking Linda McAvan um, about all sorts of questions that we need to be answered. She did seem to be on the defensive quite a lot. Well, I don't know who wrote the, I mean, Lancet publishes different views, and the medical profession has been divided to a certain extent. She didn't want to, to look at it. She didn't want to say, yeah, what, what is actually here is right. It's just, it's not what she wants. I don't know who these doctors are, not from the UK. She was actually in one of the sessions where uh, Jacques Suzak um, was actually there. 
and he was one of the authors of that report. You know, my message to Linda and to all those MEPs who, who are trying to introduce restrictive measures is see the big picture, the big opportunity we have here to shift people away from conventional cigarettes onto e-cigs with massive potential health benefits. According to Jeremy Mean at the MEHRA, there is nothing currently on the market that would qualify as a medicinal electronic cigarette. The whole point with Jeremy Means when I mentioned what he had said, she'd never heard of that. That's not my understanding of what the MHRA has actually said. He did say that and we've asked for an interview three times and each time he's declined. When the government consulted on how we regulate these products, whether as medicines or as other products, the public health community, the NHS, the public health bodies, all supported medicines regulation. Jeremy Mean won't do an interview, um, probably because of all the flack he got from his little YouTube video, um, which was put up, instantly disliked by anyone who watched it, and then the comments were turned off. But despite the public outcry, some people still can't see this action as a ban. We are not trying to take them off the market, not trying to ban them at all. But when you look at what medicinal regulation would do for the e-cig industry, it's hard to see it any other way. We contacted the MHRA uh, to find out the costs that would be involved in us uh, licensing all the products that we currently have and the reply we got back was that we would need 900 MA licenses which would cost in excess of £1.8 billion. There's a real danger that MEPs who voted for tight controls on e-cigs force them to go through a whole load of regulatory bodies that will be expensive are playing into the hands of the big pharmaceutical or the big tobacco companies. And of course they're best placed, they have the resources to um, comply with any regulatory measures and testing requirements that may be introduced. The winners in all of this will not be those consumers smoking electronic cigarettes. It will be the pharmaceutical companies because you will end up going to the doctors uh, to get your electronic cigarettes. And of course my argument continues to be, if I can go and buy 40 cigarettes, why on earth can't I buy an e-cigarette? It's completely ludicrous. And I suspect there'll be many e-cig users who'll be going onto the internet and obtaining supplies directly from China or from some other outlet, which will circumvent the rules. And you know, if that helps save lives, if that helps people move away from conventional tobacco cigarettes to, um, to, to, to something which is a much safer product, then I applaud that. I'll welcome it, even if it does mean that European law is being broken. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch our short video presentation. The footage you've just seen represents a fraction of the footage that we've gathered when making this documentary. And the story of the electronic cigarette continues to change and evolve daily. My story is everybody else's who's affected by this regulation. I discovered them Christmas 2009 because I didn't want to smoke around my kids and I didn't want to smoke around my mum. I, I think these are fantastic. I think they're great. It, they, they, both the, the community side of things and the actual device itself has enabled me to see a future that I can spend seeing my kids grow up. Are you going to see Grandma? Yeah. As an electronic cigarette user, a father and a husband, I really do not want to have to be forced to go back to smoking. And that's what SaveEcigs.com is doing with their campaign. It's not just about the vapour, it's the people who stand behind them as well. They are all affected by this reg regulation and they're all stories that need to be told. And Smoke Without Fire, the story of the electronic cigarette, will include them. I hope that this regulation will not go through and I will not have to watch someone returning to smoking. Um, in the time between that video being shot and edited together and sent to us to play the other day, um, one of the e-cigarette companies in the UK had made enquiries of 
the UK's regulator, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority, asking whether or not, under current regulations, e could be classed as a medicine by function. Now, there are, there are two limbs, two ways to do it. One is by presentation, where you would say, this is a medicine, and it's there to do what MRT does. That's by presentation, where you actually say, this is a medicine. The other one is where a regulatory authority looks at something and says, it functions as a medicine, even though you don't say it is, and therefore we would treat it as a medicine. In the case of E6, um, we've taken the view from four years ago that they are the diet coke to the full fat coke, coke light to ordinary coke. The harm is reduced. A reply has come through from the MHRA and it says as follows, that the MHRA has considered whether the claimant's products are capable of falling within the definition of medicinal product by function. The MHRA has decided that further to the current legal framework and policy considerations under which the agency operates, <coughs> there is no legal requirement for a marketing authorization. Let me read that again. The MHRA has decided that further to the current legal framework and policy considerations under which the agency operates, there is no legal requirement for a marketing authorization. What that means that in the UK, at least, the MHRA cannot force e to be medicinal by function. They know they could not do it. If the European Parliament carries on with the Tobacco Products Directive as it stands at the moment, then the EU would force the MHRA and every other medicines regulatory authority in Europe to treat e as medicines. And as you see in the video, that would mean in many parts of Europe they would only be available in pharmacies and very, very tightly restricted. Now, with me on the panel today, we have three men for whom I have got the greatest of respect. I'm just a vapor. I characterize myself as a big man with a big mouth who's not scared to use it. That's pretty much where I am. But we've got experts in their field, and these are acknowledged experts. Um, from your left to your right, Jacques Uzek, Clive Bates, and Professor Jerry Stimson. I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves and speak to you for a few minutes just to let you know where they stand on these. As I say, I hold these men in the highest of regard and I hope you will listen to them very carefully because what they will tell you is the truth. We'll start with Jacques. Jacques, over to you. you press the little button on there, you'll get a microphone up. Got it. Good day, very well. <coughs> well, uh, I'm talking here as a, a specialist uh, of nicotine pharmacology for about 30 years and uh, uh, working on, on tobacco dependence for as much. In, in tobacco dependence, no, nicotine is not the problem. The smoke is. Uh, nicotine is partly responsible for tobacco dependence, but not for the harm. Nicotine is a pretty, pretty safe drug, as Jean-Francois Eter stated in the, the video. Uh, at the doses a smoker or a vapor uses. But because of the speed of absorption due to inhalation of nicotine in tobacco smoke, uh, it creates uh, a very strong dependence. Smoking nicotine brings the nicotine to the brain faster than an IV injection. And that's why it creates such a, a strong dependence. The harm is due to the inhalation of smoke, whatever smoke it is. The one from a barbecue is not uh, harmless, but you rarely try to inhale it. Tobacco smoke uh, contains more than 7,000 compounds with 50 cancer causing. Uh, substances, oxidant gases, and moreover carbon monoxide, uh, which is highly harmful for the heart and the cardiovascular system. 
because it takes oxygen place on hemoglobin. It binds to hemoglobin 200 times more than oxygen. So the result is that uh, it reduces drastically uh, the, <coughs> the availability of oxygen for body organs. This is one reason uh, of the smoking ban laws, smoke-free laws, because uh, second-hand smoke is even more harmful because it contains more toxins. Pure nicotine is less addictive than neo nicotine. When I say pop, that nicotine is partly responsible, it's because in the tobacco smoke there are other substances uh, which probably uh, enhance the nicotine addictiveness. Uh, an example of the monoamyl oxidase inhibitors. Probably why um, vapors report that uh, vaping seems less addictive. They tend to uh, use less nicotine with time, and they often uh, forget about their physics, which uh, they would have thought impossible when they were a smoker. The speed at which nicotine enters the brain is probably uh, slower with e-cigarettes, uh, but we need more data on this. On this. Uh, e cigs are much safer than smoking. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, it, I mean, which, which makes sense uh, because there is none of the toxicant from tobacco smoke in an e -cig. So it's probably at least 1,000 times less harmful. And the new thing is that vapors talk to each other. Uh, that's new for the, the, the tobacco control community. Uh, it's not worthy that they have gathered on internet and created forums where they help each other, talk to each other, not in, only in their own country, but from country to country. Petitions of thousands of signatures have been initiated in many countries. Germany and France are examples. In France, an ind independent association of vapors called Aegis has 40,000 members and has already collected 30, over 32,000 signatures <coughs> that they plan to uh, remit to MEPs in Strasbourg. They also communicate communicate with the press and publish regularly statements and counter-arguments, like last week after the famous paper from 60 million consumers in France. I'm sure you've heard about it. So members are very, very active and, uh, and they help a lot the association. Avalon is one. But in conclusion, I would like to pay a tribute to someone who was uh, who has been very important in my career, Michael Russell. Michael Russell said in 1991, it's not so much the efficacy of new nicotine delivery systems as temporary aids to cessation, but their potential as long-term alternatives to tobacco that makes the virtual elimination of tobacco a realistic future target. Such product should be actively promoted on the open market to compete with tobacco products. <clears throat> they will need health authority endorsement, tax advantages, and support from anti-smoking movement if tobacco use is to be gradually phased out altogether. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. And next up is, again, an, another man who's been extremely supportive and, again, who I hold in the highest regard. Um, I'll let you tell everybody your background. <laughs> given, you. given where he's come from, um, I'd, I'd be proud to call him a friend. Clive? <laughs> um, my name is Clive Bates. I was Director of Action on Smoking and Health in the United Kingdom from 97 to 2003, and then since then I've been a civil servant, 
till 2012 for the UK government, mostly. And now I run my own consultancy and I have no competing interests, no links to the e-cigarette, tobacco or pharmaceutical industry. And I'm not paid by the European Commission or any charities like that. So um, I want to make five uh, quick points on this about the directive, the Tobacco Products Directive, which is going through revision at the moment. Uh, and we, we should, on current plans, it'll be in the plenary, Parliament's plenary, on the 9th and 10th of September, although there is a move um, from many of the MEPs to have it delayed because the papers only became available on Friday this week, which is far too short for proper consideration. It should be delayed quite long. First point, um, we need to focus on the big picture. Okay, There's a lot in the directive, but there's a lot of that is froth. So stuff to do with slims, with flavours, with warning, packaging, everything. It'll make a difference, but it'll be a very small difference. Okay, and even the European Commission says it will only affect consumption by around 2%. Um, and that translates to a reduction in prevalence, the number of percentage of people smoking, going from 28% to 27.4%. It's in the noise. It's not very much. On the other hand, the impact that you could have with e-cigarettes comparatively could be enormous. And we have one US analyst now saying that e-cigarettes could overtake cigarette consumption within 10 years. Okay, now, uh, if you like, a 50% inroad into the cigarette market is gigantic transformational change. And given those things are at least 99% less risky than cigarettes, there's a huge public health dividend that comes from that, and it far outweighs anything else in the directive. So that's the thing to get right. The second thing is related to that, is this is an amazing disruptive technology. Goldman Sachs, the investment bank, rates this as one of the top eight disruptive technologies in the world now, the e-cigarette. And what it will disrupt is the cigarette-based business model of the global tobacco industry. And the top, I think the top six tobacco companies worldwide have revenues of around $350 billion. So if, if you get something like a 50% or even a 10% inroad into that, you're talking about a gigantic shift in, in the marketplace. And with that comes huge public health potential. To remember, the WHO uh, says that a billion people will die from smoking cigarettes or smoking tobacco <coughs> on current trends in the current century, in the 21st century. A billion deaths. If you start to get big inroads into that, into the um, use of cigarettes um, by e-cigarettes, which cause virtually no harm, um, then you've got a huge public health dividend worldwide. And that's, that's why I'm particularly interested, just because of the potential to save lives, avoid illness, and so on. Third point, though, we get to some of the themes that were addressed in the film. The, the authorities, the European parts of the European Parliament, not all by any means, uh, the European Commission, members of the Council, British government, many other governments, want to regulate these things as medicines. A few things wrong with that, and they're seriously wrong. First of all, as many have said, they're not medicines. And when you try and regulate um, something that isn't a medicine as a medicine, you're bound to get it wrong, but more importantly, you're bound to face legal challenges in future. We have to remember there's been four successful legal challenges within Europe already on the designation of um, e-cigarettes as medicines. And there will be more if they press ahead with this. So it doesn't create legal certainty, it will uh, cause uncertainty in the long run. In terms of the impact it would have and why there would be a legal challenge, is medicines regulation requires the entire supply chain for e-cigarettes to be converted to pharmaceutical level production standards. Now that is huge overkill. Given that most nicotine is sold at the moment in the form of cigarettes, which are obviously nicotine comes in a sort of filthy haze of smoke, you don't need to go all the way to pharmaceutical standards to do very much better than that. But the problem is all the current suppliers will have to spend a fortune, money that they don't have, money that they can't borrow, to upgrade facilities to pharmaceutical standards. And it's completely unnecessary, very expensive, and it will close most of the firms in the business at the moment. Um, 
Another impact it will have is that it will mean that the large range of products that there are on the market just will disappear. They just just be too expensive to get a justification for every combination of strengths and flavours. We already we already saw that that uh, in the film somebody had estimated 800 marketing authorizations would be needed. It's ridiculous. They're never going to be able to do that. We've already heard that in many countries in Europe, the main Germany. France, uh, Italy and Spain, not the UK, um, these products can only be sold in pharmacies, so that would reduce their availability. The end result of medicines regulation would be consolidation into a small number of large firms, probably owned by the tobacco industry, selling a narrow range of commoditized cigarettes at higher prices in restricted retail settings. Okay, it wouldn't be a total ban on all products, but it would be a ban on most products that most people are using at the moment. Um, there is another fourth point. There is another way. The existing consumer products regulation is perfectly adequate for it if it was applied and enforced properly, um, and, and if necessary, the, com the commission could go further in another round of legislation in the next um, in the next parliament. And fifthly, um, it's not stri strictly with us today, but it's the same harm, harm reduction concept. There is no case whatsoever to ban. Um, snus, smokeless tobacco, which is another feature of the directive. Exactly the same argument supply, it's very, very much less risky, 95 to 99% risky. It's been enormously successful, a great public health win in Sweden. The Parliament, the Commission, the Council want to ban it. It makes no sense, it's completely wrong. So we're here, I'm here, because we support the harm reduction concept, and there's a huge potential for that. And the next speaker, uh, Jerry, is, uh, made, has had a long and distinguished career in pursuing harm reduction in fields other than in tobacco. Thank you, Clive. Um, as Clive's just said, not stealing anybody's thunder. Um, no, it's all right. <laughs> um, again, a man I've, I've got, I hold in the highest regard, as do most EC users in the UK and across Europe. I regard him as being the father of harm reduction. Um, and I've learned an awful lot from him. Jerry, I'll hand it straight across to you. You always make me feel a bit too old, but thanks very much. Um, I'm a, a public health social scientist and I spend much of my uh, academic and research and policy career on helping to develop harm reduction in the 1980s and the 1980s for people using illicit drugs. I mean, as you remember, as you might know from history books or remember if you were there, we were faced with a huge problem of uh, potential spread of bloodborne viruses, HIV and so on, through injecting drugs. And we really had a public health challenge. What on earth could we do to help people uh, who are unable or unwilling to stop using drugs, to stop injecting? What on earth could we do, faced with that public health emergency, to help them reduce the risks that they were facing uh, uh, through, through their, their drug use. I, I'm a latecomer to, to tobacco, but there are huge, huge parallels. We've got large numbers of people still in Europe who smoke cigarettes. 28% of people really in adults in, in, in Europe smoke um, cigarettes. Our tobacco policies are really not that imaginative. We're only chipping away very gradually in the percentage of people who are smoking um, and even you know with the TPD and you know, in my country the UK uh, there are only really prospects of reducing the prevalence of smoking by maybe sort of half a percent a year over the next 10 years but we have staring us in the face various technologies which can help people who don't want to give up nicotine but don't want to smoke and so the, the e-cigarette come along as a really, as it's already been mentioned, a really disruptive technology. As disruptive as, in a sense, as the original cigarette was when it was introduced, when the tobacco cigarette roller machine was introduced in the 1880s. So it has the potential to really change the landscape. There are other new nicotine, other nicotine products as well, which are far less hazardous than, um, than, than uh, tobacco cigarettes. Um, I've mentioned snus, which is only, uh, it can only be legally sold in, in Sweden, has an exemption. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a, 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 an oral um, pasteurized tobacco. Snus, 
Sweden has the lowest prevalence of smoking uh, in Europe, has the lowest rates of lung cancer amongst men in Europe. So the variety of products and the whole landscape of nicotine products is fast moving and fast um, changing. And uh, it really has the, the potential, potential uh, to have huge um, public health gain. Now all this has been really like a quiet consumer-led revolution. There's been no public health push behind e-cigarettes. There have been no health services money spent on e-cigarettes. There have been no doctors or stop smoking clinics who have been roped in to sell or promote or persuade patients to use e-cigarettes. And of course it's not been a medical revolution but a consumer revolution. People are using these cigarettes, they don't want to see themselves as ill or needing treatment or having to go to a pharmacy for NRT. Um, they're making a choice to switch. So the whole perception of this is it's a switching, and as uh, somebody said on a, uh, in a discussion that I was in, these are not smoking cessation devices, but they're smoking sensation devices. So they help people stop smoking, but allow people to continue using uh, nicotine. And their ability to do that is being shown by the fact that e-cigarettes are now in Europe, have now overtaken the sales of nicotine replacement therapy. So the e-cigarette market is now bigger than the NRT market. So in every country in Europe you've got stop smoking plans and clinics and NRT being pushed. Vast amount of money, well money going into that, yet out of people's own pockets, people are switching to um, e-cigarettes. Now, that is all being missed in the TPD, as, as Chris Davis says in, in, in video there. See the big picture. And the problem is the TPD doesn't see the big picture. It's framed in, a, in, a, in an outdated model of tobacco control. New products come along, got to control them. In fact, you know, controlling e-cigarettes under the this proposed legislation much more than you control uh, tobacco cigarettes. So it's a controlling framework rather than a public health framework. And what we should be doing in Europe is saying, we've got these new products, how can we improve them? How can we promote them? How can we facilitate their use? So we'd rather we've got the opposite. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, we'd like to open the floor for questions now. You've heard what each of the speakers have said. <laughs> is there anything we can ask you? Hello, Dr. Fasenay, this is right. You can take questions as well. He's been driving from Holland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's always going to be good, isn't it? Yes. Would you have Are there uh, any questions?
and um, that was that was the press conference. Um, there followed after that a question and answer session that went on for thirty minutes, nearly. 30 to 40 minutes, yeah. Um, it went on for quite a while. Um, Dr. Farsalinus was extremely um, verbal and voluble, answered all of the technical questions that the, uh, the various different members of the press fired at him. And there were people there from the Wall Street Journal, uh, the New York Times, the, uh, the various different press agencies that are around, and video cameras as well. Uh, and the video cameras followed us all over the place. But Saf, I, I want to find out what chat's been saying. I would imagine they'd have been watching that very closely. Well, first of all, I have to apologise because I was watching that very closely as well. So <laughs> Again. I haven't pulled out as anything like as many comments as I should have done. But most people were saying exactly the same things. Um, they were astounded by the panel. And I do have to say my favourite quote, and I can't remember who said it, was it's Dave Tannion and the Three Musketeers, <laughs> <laughs> which I did like. <laughs> but um, regarding the SWAT video, Liam D. Vapor said he's got goosebumps listening to that, and I have to agree, so did I. And me. Yeah, Mark Shaw has said, we all have to remember that a lot of these guys and girls helping are not Vapors, and yet, like Chris and Rebecca, they have the same passion for us and for our cause. That, for me, commands the highest respect. Mm-hmm. Mitch Doggers says regarding um, what Clive Bates was saying is he says it all, a clever, legitimate, independent, verified expert. I wish more people could hear Clive's point of view. Lamental has said simply astound astounding stuff. Well done, all involved. Our very own Gary Dibley has said stunned at the footage on the show. And Peter Collins has just said so much common sense and logical arguments can't understand how anybody with a brain could disagree. And that it's just all the same comments have been coming in over and over and over again. They were so impressed with the panel and the, the questions that were answered. I've, I've got to say, um, it, it, was, it, it, it was a massive privilege to be sitting in the company of the four guys. Uh, Jacques Uzek, who is brilliant, Clive Bates, who is brilliant, Professor Jerry Stimson, who is brilliant, and Dr. Farsalinos, who is brilliant. I mean, it makes you feel quite humble, very humble, to be sat in their presence, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was sitting at the back, um, tweeting what was going on, and I sent, I think I only managed to send four or five tweets because I was so absorbed in what they had to say, and there were times where it was either goosebumps or a lump in your throat to know that these guys were batting for you. It was just amazing. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And I should tell you that um, the whole of the question and answer session was also recorded. That will, I'm sure, be appearing in a swath video near you quite soon. Um, Dr. Farsalinos was so well on form, but seriously, we've kind of got to finish this side of midnight. Um, <laughs> if we can, um, and th then there's still a lot to go through. It, it was a great privilege to be there. Once we'd gone through the press conference, which I'm told by members of the press corps that I was talking to later, went very well, and was very well received by members of the press there, and I think they'll have, they'll have been writing the right things, and I, I certainly hope that that's the case, and we'll keep you in touch with that as best we can. Um, we went from there up to it's called Parliament Square, isn't it? Or well, not that it's yeah, I think so. Not that it's square or anything like that. And um, we we presented the, the the petition, the letter that everybody'd been signing, and there were lots and lots and lots of MEPs and lots and lots of cameras. And there's a a bit of footage here. I'll just I'll just play in, and it, it's unedited. It's just come straight out raw, but it'll give you some idea of what was going on and how keen. MEPs were to be involved with this. It was something to behold. Press the button so. Recreational drive, something correct. 
Joan has already asked me today what I what I used to put in my role. <laughs> And, and as you can see, um, Sav was stood there, <laughs> kind of making sure, playing, running interference, if you like. But Sav, um, you you were spoken to by loads and loads of people. What, what again? What feeling did you get? It was overwhelming. I, uh, there were people coming up to us that you, if you were busy off doing interviews. First of all, I had the people from Czech TV that came straight up to me, going, "We need to interview Dave," and I'm like. Okay, first, how do you know who Dave is? And second, how do you know that I know who Dave is? <laughs> Which <laughs> amazed me. And me. Yeah. Um, <coughs> they were like, well, we need to talk to him now. And you were in the middle of an interview with ITV at that time. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, you're going to have to, to hang on. They were like, well, can we interview you? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Definitely not. Uh, so it was sort of sorted them out. And then there was aides from various MEPs coming up and saying, right, we need Dave to come and do this and we want Dave to come and talk to us about this and can can you get Dave to tell us where we have to do what we have to talk to people about and what exactly it is he wants us to say and I'm standing there going what? what you want me to, to, to you want me to do what? <laughs> it, was, it was completely overwhelming that these people were coming to me and looking for Dave to ask us what we wanted them to do it was it was i have to say surreal absolutely surreal that m members of the european parliament from the tory party lib dems ukip there were everything by the socialists there wasn't a labor politician in sight no nowhere nowhere was there a labor politician in sight that came to either find out or lend support. Didn't expect them to lend support, but I did expect them to come and have a nosy and see what was going on. There yeah. was, wasn't one. There was a few came out for a fag afterwards. I noticed. Yes, there was. Yes. Yes, that was but. definitely the case. Um, but yeah, it, there was all kinds of stuff going on. Um, go on, yeah. Sav. You've got something to say that I know. Well, I know I spent a lot of time, when you were talking, when you were doing interviews and the MEPs were being interviewed and things like that, I spent a lot of time talking to their aides and things like that. And the overwhelming thing that they kept saying to me is this is being talked about in sight. It's being talked about in the hallways between people. It's being talked about in the offices. They know who we are and they know what we've got to say. Finally, they know. Yes, and but the, 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 the important part... Whoops. Um, vapor. Sorry, it's not smoke, it's fine, it's vapor. Um, the important part about it is they knew we were there as vapors. They knew that we weren't the tobacco lobby. Yeah. And that's interesting. Yeah, I got asked that quite a few times when people come and say, so you've come over here as a vapor. What makes you feel passionate enough about this? And when I explained to them, they were going, wow, um, yeah, I can understand why you were doing this. This is ridiculous. Uh, it was amazing. Ab absolutely. I, I, I mean, there, there is no other word for it. The MEPs who are... I've got to be careful and choose me words. The MEPs that are intelligent enough to have done the research and realised what the big picture is and realised what this is all about understand that we were there to save e-cigs as vapors, as consumers as the users of these things, that we're not tobacco lobbyists. Exactly. Just had a, a comment that's come in, thanks to Kat, who's so brilliantly grabbing things for me. Uh, Craig Booth has just said, Churchill would get, would get out of his grave to applaud this. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I've got to say, uh, on behalf of everybody that was across there, from Clive, Jerry, Dr. Farsalinos, uh, Jacques Luzek, Sav, myself, Everybody that was involved, it was a great pleasure and privilege to be over there to present our side of the story. Um, somebody, I think it was from the New York Times, one of the journalists from the New York Times did say, is this not all a bit one-sided? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it, w- it was answered quite well. I-, I wish we had the time to play all the footage in because it, w- it was just, well, like, basically all you've had so far is propaganda. That's what you've had from the other side. What you've heard today is the truth. But we're here to save e cigs We're not going to rubbish them. These things are the most important invention probably of the 21st century. I think that has to be said and I think that's absolutely right. Of course there are some people that don't get it isn't there? Yes. There's one person in particular doesn't get it Um, and this is the person who has really rattled this through Um, and I didn't realise she was being interviewed and unfortunately she didn't come outside to be interviewed where everybody else was. And I'm here to tell you Clive Bates was interviewed, Jacques Uzek was interviewed and he's coming up shortly because we've got that. Um, everybody that was involved in this, with the exception of Sav who kept running away every time she saw a camera. I was not being interviewed no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Everybody got interviewed, all of the MEPs, everybody, and the, it's europeandyou.com, the site, has mm-hmm. got loads. We'll have links to, to uh, the site itself. That's, we've posted yeah. that already, haven't we? Um, we've got them all up, all the individual videos are all linked on our Facebook page. Well, there you go. So if, if you want to see all of the videos back to back, you can go to our Facebook page and they're there, and I'm sure we'll be tweeting them and other people will be tweeting them as well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say, if you're not on Twitter, you should be, because it's all kicked off on there during the course of the day, and I will kind of get round to that. Well, let's let's get to this one person who still doesn't see the big picture, who still doesn't understand why things are the way they are. And another MEP might explain why a little bit later on. But this is Linda McAvan, or McAvan, or McAvan, or how the hell of you want to pronounce it. And she gave an interview, um, and we're going to have a game of Porky Pie Bingo. It's called Porky Pie Bingo. Spot how many Porky Pies are told in this interview. Linda McFran, Labour MEP for Yorkshire and the Humber. You're in charge of this legislation that's coming through the European Parliament. A lot of voices on both sides. Why do you want to see e-cigarettes regulated as a medical product? Well, firstly, they have to have some kind of regulation, and even the companies themselves will recognise that. At the moment, these products are on the market. Um, the British government did an investigation through the Medical Regulatory Agency, and they found that there were problems with lots of the products they tested. So there's a general agreement that should be regulated. The question is then, how should they be regulated? And if we think about other products to help people quit smoking, they're regulated by medicine not like a medicine to treat a drug but a light touch medicine regime and that's what we're proposing and let's be clear about what kind of impact if this goes through uh, as as it may be voted on next week um, let's be clear on what the impact would be would this mean for example that you would only be able to get hold of e-cigarettes by getting a prescription from your doctor. That's one of the, perhaps, myths that uh, some people are, are suggesting. No, not at all. In the UK, you can buy medicines anywhere. You can buy them in garages, you can buy them in supermarkets. So in the UK, in terms of where you can buy the products, not very much would change. What would change, however, is the products would be cheaper because a medical product has less VAT on it. That's one thing. And secondly, very importantly, if you were a heavy smoker, I think e-cigarettes could help people who do smoke quit. I've, I've met people, I know that's evidence. If they're regulated, as a, if they're a medicine product, they could be actually prescribed to people to help them quit. So there'll be benefits as well. And it's certainly not true, as I've had lots of letters that we're trying to ban e-cigarettes. That is not the case at all. And about the regulation, um, you say that it could lead, in fact, to lower costs. That's very interesting because uh, people on the other side of the coin are saying that it could increase costs. They say that every single variety of e-cigarettes would have to be registered. That would be very, very costly uh, and uh, it would see e-cigarettes become much more expensive. Well, that's not what the UK government say. The UK government, the Conservative Liberal Coalition government, they're very clearly in favour of regulating the medicines. And it'd be the UK Regulatory Authority which would do that. And they've looked into this. They had a three-year study on this. And their conclusion, and the the conclusion of 
everybody else, top doctors in the UK, everybody who works in helping people quit smoking, is that this is the best path to make sure the products are safe, that we know what's in them, and that they really help people quit. Because at the moment, you're relying on what's on the packaging label, but it's not being tested. So you, you as a smoker, want to, want to reduce your smoking. You want to know how much nicotine you're getting. You rely on having proper labelling. That's not happening at the moment. So every, every expert I've met wants this to happen. And it's only the e-cigarette companies who don't. They want to make money. Of course they don't want to pay for regulatory um, procedures. They want to make profits. That's normal. But I'm a legislator. We can't just listen to the industry side. E-cigarette users that are concerned about this regulation say that uh, it could cost lives because they believe that e-cigarettes will be harder to get hold of as a result of this legislation if it goes through. Well, I don't see any evidence for that. I mean, certainly there are some countries where medicines are only available in pharmacies, but that's national legislation and the governments of those countries could change that. In the UK, that's not the case. You can buy medicines anywhere. E-cigarettes will be available as they are now. And um, it's simply not true. Is there a risk that uh, if this regulation goes through that uh, users could instead turn to places like China and start buying uh, unregulated products from outside the European Union? Well, nearly all e-cigarettes are actually made in China at the moment. They're imported into the UK and the companies are mainly importers of e-cigarettes. So we don't have manufacturers and that's one of the issues. We have to be sure about the safe manufacturing of these products. So, and there are some e-cigarette companies who actually want a regulatory framework because they're making investments and they don't want sort of cow by products on the market. So it, if we want these products to help people reduce their smoking, I think we have to know they're safe, that people know what's in them and, and that they work. And I don't think they should be placed on the market like a ballpoint pen's place on the market. These are things that people are inhaling. And we also have a new phenomenon as well, which is about could they become a new gateway product for young people? Because there's some very advertising of them to young people and I know that there have been reports in the media of schools having problems with these cigarettes because at the moment in Britain there's no legislation so anybody can buy them there's no age limits on who can buy them and who can they be marketed to so there are lots of issues to resolve. Is there a risk that more regulation could see people that are using e-cigarettes at the moment going back to using tobacco, going back to becoming tobacco uh, uh, smokers? Presumably that would be the opposite to what you want to achieve. Isn't that a risk? Well, we have no evidence of that at the moment. The problem is we have no evidence at the moment of what the benefits are of e-cigarettes. We don't really know whether e-cigarettes are helping people to quit. We have anecdotal evidence. We don't have any real evidence. We don't know whether they just help smokers stay smokers because some people use them to smoke on the train or on the plane or in the pub and then they go back and smoke. So we have evidence of dual use. So instead of people quitting smoking, some people are staying smokers because of e-cigarettes. Some people are helping them reduce. So we... A lot of work needs to be done and the British medical regulators are going to do that work. They, they want to have a proper look at this. They don't want it just to be a free-for-all. They want to look at it, they want to monitor it and they want to make the best decisions in people's interests. So let's be clear, what will the impact of this be? And what difference will we see if this goes through as you'd like it to as e-cigarettes classed as medical products? Well, tomorrow nothing because if we agree the law this year, they're going to have nearly four years the e-cigarette companies to comply with a new law, so their products remain on the market. They're going to have to adapt over time, but they get four years. The British regulator has made it clear that they will make a simple registration process. There won't be any clinical trials because we know what nicotine does. And so people who use these cigarettes will not see a big change tomorrow. There'll be a, the companies themselves will have to follow the legislation, but they'll have a long, long transitional period before they have to comply. Two final questions. One, what would happen, in your view, if you don't win your vote, if MEPs don't agree to class this as a medical product? Well, MEPs are only one part of the legislative process in Europe. Lawmaking is done not just by us, but by the governments of Europe. Every single government in Europe believes that e-cigarettes should be classified as medicines. Every single government in Europe. So the MEPs, if we vote, if we have vote the other way, we have to find an agreement with the governments and given that its regulatory systems happen at national level um, we'd, have to, we'd have to have a lot of persuasion of governments to change their minds because any law has to be agreed by both sides.
And just finally, there uh, has been some reports about e-cigarette companies sponsoring football grounds and even in the case of Derby County reports that uh, samples of e-cigarettes are being handed out on match days. Um, what do you make of that? Is that something you'd be concerned about? Well, responsible e-cigarette companies tell me that they want their products only to be used by smokers to help them reduce their smoking. I don't think I don't want to see products given out to young people who could become nicotine addicts. And everybody I've spoken to is an e-cigarette user. Wouldn't want their children to just start using e-cigarettes because it's cool. So I don't think it's a very responsible thing to be giving them out outside football grounds any more than outside schools. I think um, they should. If the industry wants to have a future, I think it has to behave in a responsible manner. And uh, if it doesn't behave in a responsible manner, it will get more and more regulation. At the moment, like I said, we have no regulation for these products. They're a new product. And every doctor I've spoken to, every expert, every government official, they want, they want some kind of regulatory framework, and that's what I support. Um, I've, I need some 72 milligram. Saf, what have you been saying? <laughs> <laughs> Keep it clean. Keep it clean. <laughs> But I tell you who won the bingo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, 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 just for reference, I should say I counted thirty-three outright porky pies in that little lot. Yeah, the mental got closest to that. <laughs> <laughs> but there was one comment that I didn't manage to grab, so I wrote it down as it was passing. So I have no idea who said it, and I only got half of it. But regarding evidence, they said seven years evidence. We have seven years evidence, so stop spouting poop. Was poop the word? Poop was the word. That's oh. why I liked it. Well done, chat. Yes. I'd have said shite. Yeah, me too. Yeah, there you go. Anything more? Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> that's that's fair. No, nothing, nothing we can read out on her. So was the, my chat screen was just going nuts. I'm like, I don't know. I am not even going to try. Okay, I take it, chat. I'm not very happy with Mrs. Well, the impression I got is that... The didn't really like her that much. Okay. I got that impression from a few people in Brussels as well, didn't you? I did, yes. Yes. Well, one or two, yeah. Yes. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind, as I said earlier on, the vote that might still take place next week, but we'll get to that, um, was originally due to be in October, and she's brought it forward. It's come forward at Mrs. McAvan's request, and you have to wonder why would she want to do that? And I'll tell you for why. It's because as every day goes by, MEPs are listening to what you tell them. They are listening to your stories. They are listening to the evidence that's being presented by people like Clive Bates, by Jerry Stimson, by Jacques Luzek, by Dr. Konstantinos Farsalinos, and by mostly the users. Because we are let's face it, the important people in this. It's our lives that are at stake and it's our choice to choose to use what we want to use. If you want to use tobacco, well, that's fine. I mean, that whole bit about dual use, dear me. Has she got no idea? P dual users, and I know a fair few, Keith is one. Keith has cut right down. He has two cigarettes a day where he used to have 10. That's 20% of what it was. I think that's pretty damn good, he said, looking at completely the wrong camera. Um, it's going to be like that, isn't it? How it is. Well, sh let's, let's move into, uh, into what Jacques had to say. Um, I'm going to go to Jacques Lehuzek because right after the, uh, the press conference, Jacques gave an interview. Have a listen to this. Sterling stuff. What's your argument uh, on the regulation of, of e-cigarettes? It's been 30 years uh, that I'm working in the nicotine field, so uh, I've been very much interested in, in e-cigs just by the, the fact that it works. Uh, and it was so uh, surprising uh, because we've been waiting for, for new products for, for a very long time that this is really a revolution in the field. When you say it works, do you mean that this is a, a viable alternative to, to cigarettes? And is there evidence to, to prove that uh, uh, cigarette users are, are in fact uh, quitting smoking? 
it seems obvious from, from what we see, and uh, I've been looking at the, the Vapors forum to, to, to chat with them and, and discuss with them about this, and it's really impressive. And I've seen it around me, people switching and quitting smoking very fast. We've never seen that happen before uh, with an RT or any other product. And what do you think the impact of, of this regulation could be if it goes ahead as planned? Uh, it will be very bad because uh, e-cigs need to compete with cigarettes. Cigarettes are totally free on the market. They can do anything they want. Uh, if e-cigs are regulated as, uh, as the, the, the TPD is right now, that will be uh, a nightmare to put something on the market and that will kill uh, e-cigarettes. Are you convinced that e-cigarettes are a safe alternative to smoking given the levels of nicotine that they can contain? It is. Nicotine is not uh, the problem in smoking. The problem is the tobacco smoke. Uh, nicotine is quite safe drug uh, at the doses a smoker or a vapor inhales. Uh, the problem is the, the 7,000 more and more uh, chemicals in the tobacco smoke and none of them are in the vapors of uh, e-cigarettes. Do you accept that there is a need for regulation of the e-cigarette market, however, uh, given, for example, that e-cigarettes can contain very different levels of nicotine? Some of them may, ha may have very small levels, but others are very, very high, even, I'm told, higher than cigarettes, even though you don't feel that nicotine is the only problem with cigarettes. Well, nobody controls the content of cigarettes in nicotine. Smokers and vapors know exactly how to uh, self-titrate nicotine. If you have a strong uh, e-liquid, you will vape differently than if you have a, a, a poor nicotine content. Uh, that will just be that. You will just adjust uh, your inhaling uh, to, to the content of the e-liquid. As an expert in tobacco, what do you think will be the impact for users if this regulation goes through in its current form? Well, it will be a nightmare for them because uh, if it happens, that will kill the market. Uh, the products that will be available will probably very, be very limited and, and probably not satisfying and most of them will return to smoking. And we are back in the room. Now, you heard what Jacques had to say. And you heard what Mrs. McAvan had to say. Um, it was quite interesting, all of that, wasn't it, really? Um, it certainly was. Find it, finding the differences between the various different viewpoints. Have chat have anything to... Uh, 
chat again have got an awful lot to say. I've just pulled out a few select comments. Mark Shaw said, Jack, just say it. Just say it. I've been doing this for 30 years, so unlike an MEP who's been at it for five minutes, I know what I'm talking about. Bloody right. Yeah, spot on. And Mark Shaw also said, Linda should spend a day on my stall and see the smiles on the faces of the customers who come back after a week or two and say, I've stopped smoking normal cigarettes. Can't believe how easy it was after years of smoking. Just like I did when I took up vaping. Mm -hmm. Doug Phillips has said, if you made this into a film, nobody would believe that it was true. Everybody that I talk to cannot believe that the EU want to ban ASICs. It just does not make any sense. Plus, everyone that knows me loves the fact that I've switched. And Jock Vapor said, and I'm presuming this is about Linda McEvan's uh, Facebook page, says, on her Facebook page, she has put, every year, 100,000 people die from smoking-related diseases. And Jock says, so why are you attacking e Well, exactly. And, and I'll tell you something else as well. There's something I've, I've, I've noticed all the way through, both with uh, the interview that she gave with Marco and that interview that was on there. I cannot believe for a socialist MAP how racist she is. That just, it strikes me as being completely wrong for a socialist. The other thing that I don't quite get is why she's so in bed with Anna Soubry. Because earlier on today, I noticed she was tweeting that bit that was in, was it in the Mail or the Telegraph or wherever it was, about mm. Anna Soubry starting to smoke because she was, she was inveigled by a Sam Moritz packet. Apparently it was it's green and sexy and that was what started us smoking. Okay. I, I'm sorry, but no. I can't understand why the two of them are so close to being in bed. Did you have something else to say there, Sav? I'm sorry. Uh, I was just about to say regarding the, the pretty packet. Personally, I'm not that shallow as to be influenced by a pretty packet. But that's just me. Uh, <laughs> one thing I do want... <laughs> <laughs> now don't sit on the fence. Say what you really think. Well, yeah. <laughs> but one thing I do want to say is regarding um, the likes of Linda McEvan's Facebook page and things like that, please don't go and put a load of abuse on those pages because we, we, that would just not serve us well. Uh, you're, you're exactly right in what you say. In, in all our dealings with, let's call them the opposition, I think we do have to be, I'm just going to say the word fair, balanced. We, we've got to be polite. We've got to be informative, critical by all means, but we do have to be informative and polite. We can't just go calling them names because that gets you absolutely nowhere. And they will, they will just sort of push you aside as being a, a loony, so... Yes, yes. They're, they're already trying to tar us with the wrong brush. Let's not give them yep. any excuse to do anything else. Yeah. Talking about people who uh, tar people with brushes... Um, mm -hmm. My local, one of my local MAPs, and both, well, two of my local MAPs came down to see us. Uh, Fiona Hall, whose interview is on Europe and You, dot, the, the link's there. Um, and she came down very, very supportive. Uh, lovely, and the, lovely, lovely lady. Lovely lady, very, very sensible, uh, Lib Dem one. And Martin Callanan, who I contacted on the 19th of December and has been supportive from the very start. He gave an interview, he... Um, he has some opinions that I think it would be good to share. Because we've been wondering who's been behind all of these attacks on ACIGs. We know the World Health or, uh, Organization's been involved. The Huffington Post has managed to get involved during the course of the day as well. And I, I'd been wondering for a while, but Martin has an opinion. Okay, so e-cigarettes, do you think they should be classed as a uh, medicinal product? Um, no, I don't. I think that's a huge mistake. I think they offer a great potential for people to safely, easily and legally quit smoking. Um, and thousands of people around Europe are enjoying them. There's no evidence that there's any health problems at all. So I think they should be encouraged. And I think uh, making them classified as a medicine at the behest of the pharmaceutical lobby, I think is a huge policy mistake and we should do our best to avoid it. Do you feel that the pharmaceutical industry is playing a part in influencing decision makers? I'm certain that they are. I mean, there's a lot of money gone into to lobbying against them because they're a growing part of the market and uh, they're much more effective than patches and the various other uh, devices that the pharmaceutical lobby have come up with. Uh, and therefore, they want to see them regulated out of existence, effectively. And I think that's a big mistake um, because there's no evidence there's a health problem. 
and thousands of people are safely using them as a way to quit smoking. We should be encouraging them to commit smoking, not making it more difficult. Yeah, I mean, would you say that, you know, obviously this legislation would effectively put, put it into, um, put e-cigarettes into the hands of farmer and big tobacco? Of course, because the authorisation would be difficult and expensive to, uh, to obtain. Uh, so all the very small companies, the little SMEs that are, uh, that are doing it at the moment will find it difficult to, to obtain and uh, will push it into the hands of Big Pharma and I'm sure that's a deliberate policy. Okay, thank you. Can I just get you to, um, on camera, just agree that we can use your interview as and, and that's, that's the part where he's got to give his name and all the rest. Well, you heard what Martin Callanan had to say. Now he's an MEP, he knows how these things work in Europe. You heard what he said? I don't think I need to endorse it. Has chat picked up on that, uh, so? Yes, chat have. And again, I'll just sort of bring it down to one or two comments. There was an awful lot of comments about Martin's tie, which I have to agree with. It was very, very nice. Um, but Mark Shaw has said that's about as close to straight out of the horse's mouth as you're going to get. He's, not, he's yep, not wrong. Chat said that. Yep, he's not wrong. He's nope. not wrong. Um, I think we probably need to be winding the whole thing up, but just let me put you in the picture of where everything stands at the moment. Um, there have been moves afoot. Well, no, let's let's just run quickly through UKIP, shall we? Because this... Yes. This was surreal. Um, <laughs> meetings were organised, and, and we were kind of drawn out of the hat to who to go and... who was going to go and see who. And um, Sav and I ended up going to see Paul Nuttall, who is a UKIP member from Bootle, uh, so he's from, from the northwest. And uh, I've got to say, he's a cracking lad. Uh, he's one of the boys, isn't he? Oh, yeah, very much so. Very much one of the boys. We went into his office, first thing he did was spark a tab up. Yeah, which was so surreal. That, was, that really got to me. Yeah. MEPs can smoke in their offices. It's yes, one law for them and another law for the rest of us. That wound me up a little bit, but fine, whatever. Um, it just, I don't rank off the touch. I don't know whether it did with you. It, it sort of set me back a little bit. It was like, hang on a minute. It was just, it, it didn't sit right. It was strange. No, very, very strange. But anyway, so we went into Paul's office, we sat down with him, and his first, his first foray was, it's just wrong. It's just wrong, was what he said, wasn't it? We sat and chatted with him for a little while and told him what our thoughts were, what you know, kind of represented everybody's views as best we could. And then he said, uh, meet to Nige, didn't he? Yes. So he picked the phone up, he said, Nige, where are you? Right, we're coming over. And we ended up going to say, and this was completely off the bat, it was not scheduled, it was not an appointment or anything like that. Nigel Farage was around, we went across to see him. We walked in, we chatted with him, and he said, it's wrong. <laughs> UKIP's fully behind you, all the way. So we got it from the horse's mouth, the man himself. Um, and he was very supportive, wasn't he? He was incredibly supportive, yes. I mean, I've got to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, all of the MEPs that came down to meet us outside at the presentation, and, the, and most of the ones that, that Sav, well, all of the ones that Sav and I spoke to, were extremely, extremely supportive. I can't name check them all because there were just too many of them to be able mm -hmm. to remember all the names, but they were all extremely supportive and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that. And all of this support has been bought, brought about by you. It's not by me, not by Sav, it's by you. Constantly yep. contacting them, asking them the questions, giving them the information that you need. They are so supportive and thank you so much for doing what you're doing. Please don't stop. We got one piece of advice, which I thought was very good from both Paul and Nigel Farage. And they said, go and see your MP. Talk to your MP and ask him or her to speak to their political ally, MEP, and brief the MEP. So if, if your local uh, MP is a, 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 a Labour, then ask them to speak to the Labour MEP for your area. And that, he said, will focus their minds. It's a thought. If that's mm -hmm. going to work, we've got nothing to lose by giving it a try. And we need to be talking to M uh, MPs anyway. We do actually need to be talking to MPs because we've still got the Council of Ministers and the trialogue and everything else to go through. So 
that's that was a tip that came from there and one assumes those guys know what they're talking about i assume if a, uh, a uk mp of any elected representative from any of the countries because there'll be people watching this from all over europe i hope um go and see your local electric elected representative for your local parliament and ask them to speak to their political ally MEP on your behalf and apparently that can do a lot of good a brilliant tip to have um, what we what, what what else we need to cover basically um, this whole idea of the vote on the TPD happening in October that's when it was supposed to happen if you're on Twitter you need to be tweeting to that effect to your MEP now well not now when the show is finished as soon as possible get tweeting to that effect um if you're not on twitter get on please get on twitter it's it's proving to be one of the most effective communication mechanisms we've got with meps the majority of them have accounts on twitter and they do listen um they might fob you off but at least if there's lots and lots of the same message getting through then that's good I, if i was you i would phrase it in the way that it was meant to happen in October. It was scheduled to happen in October. It's been rushed through for no apparent reason. Can we please have it back in October? Please support any moves. Now they're voting on this apparently tomorrow morning. So we need to get onto it now. That's the way it is. I, I don't think I need to play the last video in, do you, Sav? No, I don't think so. That's all right then. <laughs> Just some Geordie Bluell, Mac and Block. Uh, so Mac and Block, uh, what was it? Uh Gob on a stick. Gob on a stick. Shall I play it? Uh, go on then. I'll play it. Um, and when we've played it, we'll be going. I'm sorry to do this, but I look so handsome. Not really. <laughs> Dave Dawn from Sunderland, you've come out to the European Parliament. You're also a presenter on uh, VaporTrails.tv, but you come from the northeast of England. First of all, why have you come all the way out to Brussels to campaign on this? Well, because the Tobacco Products Directive, as it stands at the minute, uh, intends to make electronic cigarettes into a medicine. Um, for many of the member states, not the UK, but for many of the member states, that means that e-cigs would only be available in pharmacies. And when was the last time you saw a smoker go to get 20 whatever from a pharmacy? It just doesn't happen. These need to be available wherever cigarettes are. They're a consumer product. They're not a medicine. And let me ask you about your own story, because you were a smoker, I think it's fair to say, a heavy smoker. So just explain what your background was and how you ended up as an e-cig user. Well, I used to smoke 60 cigarettes a day. Um, and at, on this particular day, a friend of mine came to where I was working and he looked as though he had a cigarette on. And I said, well, you can't use that in here. It's, you know, there's a smoking ban. And he said, no, it's not real. And that, thought, that led me to ask three questions that I've been asked thousands of times. First what is it? The second one is, can I have a go? And the third one is, where can I get one? And that's exactly what happened with me. Five days later, I hadn't smoked a cigarette again. Um, and, and is that a story that you hear from other e-cig users, that uh, they too have given up tobacco in favour of e-cigarettes? Absolutely. Time after time you hear of people that have discovered e-cigs. They've discovered a way to carry on smoking but without smoking. They're still getting the nicotine, they're getting all of the pleasure, but they're not getting any of the death. And that's a win-win situation, no matter how you look at it. And you mentioned the, the nicotine. There is some concern about the nicotine and the amount of nicotine that can be in e-cigarettes. Isn't there therefore a need for European regulation of e-cigarettes? Well, it's, it's, it's misunderstood actually, because nicotine is not the devil that everybody thinks it is. It's actually no worse for you than caffeine by itself. The harm from smoking comes from the smoke itself, as it would if you inhaled the fumes from a barbecue. It would do you just as bad a job. Um, so the nicotine levels that are in here, it actually doesn't really make a great deal of difference how much there is. I'll use it until I've had enough and then I put it down. It's exactly the same with cigarettes. Some people smoke 20 a day, some sp people smoke 10, some will smoke 60, as I used to. So I use more e-liquid than a lot of other people. It's not the problem that, that they're trying to make out, let's put it that way. You mentioned at the beginning that if it was classed as a, a medical product, that, that in some countries that would cause very big problems of, of getting hold of them. But 
turning just to the UK and particularly to the, the northeast of England, what do you think would be the impact uh, if this, uh, this, uh, this change happened, if the European Parliament did in, d does indeed vote uh, for e-cigarettes to be classed as uh, medicinal products? Well, as far as the UK is concerned, the MHRA has already stated, and I've asked this directly of them, um, that on the day of enactment, every electronic cigarette currently on the market would be taken off the shelves. They'd be removed from sale. And that would mean only the very, very biggest companies, people like British American Tobacco or Japan Tobacco International, who are currently looking at e-cigs, would be able to produce a device that would conform to the regulations that are going to be put forward. So in other words, effectively, in the UK, it is a ban. That's what it is, and that's what we need to avoid. So what would that mean for you as a user if your choice of e-cigarettes would be greatly reduced as, as, as you think it w would be? Well, I'm a nicotine user. Um, some people would say I'm a nicotine addict. If that's the case, if I am addicted, as they think I am, I'm still going to want to get nicotine. The only place I'll be able to get it is from a tobacco or cigarette. You do the maths. And that was some bloke from Sunderland being interviewed. Yeah. Chad had much to say, Sav? Chad th th thought that was awesome. And Midge Dog's comment sort of covers what Chad had to say. And he says, Dave totally speaks for me here. Superb interview, so well handled, and all pertinent points covered. Well done. Thank you, Midge Dog. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's. Let's wind this up. It's been the longest VT talk in living history, I believe. <laughs> yes. The longest VT talk in living history. Thank you for sticking with us to the end of the show. Um, please, please, please keep talking to MPs and MEPs. This is probably the most vital disruptive technology of the 21st century. It gives choice to people who need choice. Please don't be taken in. If you're an MEP, if you're a representative, don't be taken in by the propaganda that you hear. Don't be taken in by the untruths, misinformation and disinformation that you hear from the opponents of e-cigs. You've heard from an MEP who knows what he's talking about, where all this is coming from, I'm not a great conspiracy theorist, but if he, think it's, if he thinks it's true, then so do I. Um, have we got anything else to add? Because as you well know, I like chat to have the last word because it's our viewers that, you, that, that are the really important people in this. Um, and it's you that we work for. So Sav, it's over yeah. to you. I just have to say, Chad, have been absolutely amazing tonight, yeah. and I have to apologise for not getting as many of their comments as possible. But one comment that has to come from Chad, as he says, the final comment, and tonight comes from Maddie Paulus, who says, I only tuned in tonight to watch an hour of Dave's holiday photos. I was hoping for bikinis and boobs. This show has been a letdown. <laughs> <laughs> I love Maddie. <laughs> Thank you for that, Maddie. Um, the, the, the boobs and bikinis video is, it's elsewhere, it's elsewhere. Um, thanks to everybody for watching. Thanks, Sav, for everything that you've done to help me over the last couple of, well, not just the last couple My of days, pleasure. but the last few months. Um, I'm going to say this live on air. Sav is awesome. There's no other word for it. Um, we just need to say the thank yous and good night. Um, so thank you. And good night. Say good night, Sav. Good night, everybody. We'll see you. Well, I'll see you tomorrow night uh, yeah. for the Here's Hour. Hour. The Here's Hour. <laughs> right. Uh, but until we see you next time, vape on, vape hard. Don't let the bastards grind you down. See you soon. Take care.